Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fidelity ETF Exchange. I'm your host, Etienne Jean Cabouchard, and today, joining me, we have a very special guest. Uh, we're going to get to him very soon, but before, like we always do, just a little bit of a recap on our previous episodes. We started the year with our quarterly recap of ETF industry flows. Uh, we talked about trends that were coming up, some products that have been launched, and just the conversation around the Canadian ETF industry. You can catch that, you know, obviously on the podcast app that you're using or on fidelity.ca on our ETF landing page, uh, ETF podcast. So once again, recaps are all there. So today uh, I can officially say, and this is a very special episode. Uh, it's the first time we're in studio. Uh, so I'm not in my basement, which is fun. And uh, we're in Toronto and Fidelity's uh, podcast, but also webcast recording studio. And I'm joined by uh, our friend and colleague, David Tulk, portfolio manager on the global asset allocation team. Uh, Fidelity's global asset, asset allocation team is a very large team. You guys manage a lot of products, a lot of money too. And, um, you know, just as, as a number, it's more than 800 billion in assets under management, 80 billion, I think, here in Canada, and uh, obviously dozens of funds. So, David, thanks for joining me and uh, yeah, happy to have you. Yes, yeah, my pleasure. It's great to be back on the podcast. Yeah, it's true. You were one of our first guests when we initially started the podcast a few years ago. And it was great to get your perspectives on obviously asset allocation. That's that's your bread and butter. That's what you guys do. And then trying to incorporate a little bit of the ETF conversation because yes, we are biased, right? This is an ETF podcast. So I guess where we're going to start today is just a little bit of a recap from last year, which I mean, everybody listening to the podcast knows it's a very challenging year from a portfolio management standpoint, from an asset allocation standpoint. So, you know, 2022, kind of what happened? What were some of the main things that you guys had to deal with, obviously, other than some of the, the main ones that, that we know, like rates and, and inflation. But is there you know, some things that stick out that made it such a challenging year for you guys? Yeah, I think what made 2022 so difficult was the shock. So you described right. rates and inflation. And what that did for a balance fund is that it turned the correlation between stocks and bonds from being negative, which is typically what we've seen in the last 30 years and something that really underpins the notion of a balance fund and that correlation went from negative to positive. And the catalyst of that correlation turning positive was the fact that you did see that inflation shock. So really from a, a multi-asset class investor or a balanced fund manager, you really had no place to hide. I mean, you could have hit a little bit in energy to start yeah. the year. You could have been in cash, which again, we try to be fully <laughs> invested through the cycle. Yeah. Uh, or you had to be more defensive in terms of US dollars versus Canadian dollars, which mm -hmm. were a few of the things that we were able to do in the funds that we managed. So we, on a relative basis, managed to outperform our benchmark. But I understand that that's pretty cold comfort for a balanced fund mm -hmm. that turned out its worst performance basically since the Great Depression. Yeah. So managing that, uh, when we think about the bond side of a portfolio as providing insurance to the equity side, which is what you typically look for to drive your return through the cycle, the fact that the bond side of your portfolio didn't really live up to its billing and the yeah. equity side was hit by those macro shocks, again, was a really challenging environment. Yeah, those are those are all great points. And I think obviously when you put it in perspective, just how rare of an occasion a year like that is, like you said, going back to the you know Great Depression, which is I mean, obviously none in none of our lifetimes, um, you know, there's some divergences you saw, like you mentioned energy had a good year. Uh, it was like a massive sector spread also, right? Like you had energy had a really good year, but then communication services and tech, for example, obviously maybe a bit more dura like equity duration had a much tougher year. So you saw like a wide spread there. And it's, obviously that's something you guys manage internally with the PMs that you choose to use, but you can also incorporate, uh, you know, whether it's ETFs or more focused funds. Is that something that you guys actively do f to try to position from a sector standpoint? Or do you kind of let your, your players kind of manage that? Yeah, I think the core philosophy for us is maintaining diversification. Yeah. And embedded in that is having a range of building block managers who follow their own investment process, mm -hmm. uh, but generally are diversified by style in the same way that we would want to diversify by geography and even more broadly than that, diversify diversify across different asset classes. So, you know, it's very difficult to time the market. And I'd say it's almost as difficult to try to time sector rotations. Yeah. So having managers of different persuasions and you bring them into the portfolio, you don't have to necessarily worry about getting that, that rotation story correct. Yeah. Uh, and then ultimately what you're able to do is you can have those managers who 
follow their own investment process and benefit from all the research that they have access to to find you know really compelling names even in a bombed out sector. So it's that other contribution to the return from a security selection perspective that we really rely on. So you get you know the the benefit of asset allocation tilts to keep you diversified, but having that additional tailwind from security selection is something that you know is really beneficial mm-hmm. and has helped us out through various market cycles. Yeah, especially you know when there is more volatility and it is challenging, right? Like to have that active component on the stock selection side, which is uh, you know I guess. Going back to the to, to Canadian ETF industry, obviously most of the asset allocation type mandates are more passive in nature, right? Where you don't have you don't have that ability to find to have managers that are going to be able to add values in in places in difficult times. And I think that really showed up last year, uh, particularly. So that's uh, that's a really interesting point. Um, what, what we're going to do here is I'm going to give you a few flows and trends that. You know, we mentioned on our podcast to start the year, but that we've been talking about a lot in Canada over the past, I'd say, 12 to 18 months. And it has to do, obviously, with the current uh, market environments, but some of the things that we've noticed from a flow standpoint. And I just want to kind of get your take on on some of them. Uh, The first one being uh, record inflows into cash alternatives, which is obviously as rates have gone up. I mean, maybe you were getting paid close to zero to start the year and then you ended the year. You know, you get paid four, four and a half in these, you know, cash type uh etfs is that something um that you see as you know a a flow through how how do you kind of untangle that because there is it seems like there's a lot of money in cash right now still right no i I can entirely sympathize with the tendency of investors to want to hide in cash Mm -hmm. right now and as we talked about it was really one of the only asset classes that outperformed last year and that flows directly from the macro environment as well yeah um so where we sit now I mean, we held a fair bit of cash, specifically U.S. dollar cash as well. So that that sympathy is reinforced and shared by by us as well. And and part of that was recognizing the macro landscape, but also it gave us a lot of dry powder. So I would imagine that uh, the ETF holders of those cash products are also viewing that holding partly as a hedge against ongoing uncertainty, uh, Mm -hmm. but also giving themselves some more flexibility to say when there's maybe greater clarity on any of these macro themes Mm -hmm. that they can transition that um, back into the market. But, you know, it's an ongoing debate that we have on our team right now is that, you know, at some point, you know, interest rates on the on the cash side, you know, they're pretty compelling. So yeah. you can get that with near certainty relative to you know, looking at maybe bond ETFs or thinking more broadly about duration. And yeah, it's not a slam dunk that this is necessarily the year that bonds should outperform. And you can say that, yeah, typically when you see years of uh, dramatic drawdowns in, in uh, fixed income, they, you tend to see that mean revert the year after. Yeah. But I think if this is a different type of shock where if inflation is not going to come down to a low and stable level or if central banks are not quickly going to pivot this year, then I don't necessarily think that it's obviously going to be a mm-hmm. great year for fixed income. So if you can get you know four and a half five percent 5% yield with near certainty, that can be a compelling alternative, I think, to uh, t- trying to take a, an opportunity to get long duration and, mm-hmm. and, and migrate back into maybe more traditional fixed income ETFs. And you know, all of that is also taking taking place on the backdrop against the backdrop of you know an economy that is set to slow as well. So insofar as that, I don't think has fully been priced into earnings yet. Mm-hmm. So jumping back from cash into equities. Also, you know, might be a little bit. Yeah, it's it's at some point it's going to be the trade. Yeah. Um, but I think as long as earning esti- earnings estimates are being revised lower, and as long as there's uh, the belief that central banks will at some point have to drive a, re- a recession, yeah, uh, that again, I don't think we're quite cl- uh, clear there. So in terms of the way that we're positioning ourselves right now, you know, we still have a relatively defensive allocation across yeah. stocks and bonds. Uh, so still maintaining. You know, a modest overweight to cash, just reflecting that uncertainty. But on the equity side of the portfolio, we're, we're generally underweight and we're still fairly neutral on duration. But, you know, that's something that uh, I think we'll have to watch very carefully as the year goes on. OK, interesting. So maybe ETF investors aren't that crazy. <laughs> no, I would. <laughs> right. It's the collected uh, wisdom of the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If everybody's doing it, there must be a reason. Um, but uh, no, it was, it was crazy last year. Nine billion in net new e- uh, inflows into these types of products. So I just thought we'd bring that up because uh, actually you, you kind of touched on it there where you said, you know, in your your guys's funds, you know, you're still 
fairly uh, conservative, but uh, I've been at Fidelity uh, it's close to six years now. And I feel like most of the time there's been an overweight towards equities, at least in those six years in, in most of the products that, that you guys made. Let's take the global balance portfolio, for example. And now it's it's pretty much neutral, right? Or if it may be a little, a little overweight to bonds? Uh, well, I mean, we're still underweight um, equities if you take out the commodity piece. So okay. the way that we bucket uh, oh, that's our true. Commodity, uh, commodity, commodity ETFs, there. which actually fortunately are ETF products. Yeah, so you yeah. can get into that certainly. <laughs> but um, if you take out that commodity piece, you know, we're about halfway in terms of our full range of defensiveness sure. that we can take the equity side of the portfolio. So again, it's, it's the commodity piece because of the residual inflation risk yeah. um, that we would see as well. And uh, other than that, on the equity side, again, trying to more defensive, trying to stay a little bit more defensive. Okay, interesting. So actually, we can get back to that piece on the like using um, the commodity ETFs and things like that. One more thing on flows, though, because I kind of want to pick your brain on this because it feels like it's been an area that's been avoided slash underappreciated due to performance, and that's the international side. And you know, it developed international markets, emerging markets. Uh, I think there was a very sour taste in a lot of investors' mouth, you know, if you will, for, uh, for, for those markets. And, and now you're seeing flows this year coming back pretty strongly coming off of that kind of bounce that we saw at the end of last year with maybe the worst kind of was, was kind of priced in a bit faster than North America because of the ongoing geopolitical you know, risks, if you will. Um, is that something, uh, you know, I, or I guess, what's your take on that? And is there... Uh, is that something that you think can continue as we, as we move forward to, to, towards the end of the year? Yeah, I think, I mean, last year, again, it's that flight to quality that was overriding a lot of uh, investment decisions. So <clears throat> insofar as people use the U.S. dollar as that flight yeah. to safety, that really weighed, I think, on a lot of the internationally, international denominated sure. assets. So that was certainly part of the story. And, you know, when you think about the rebound in EFI and EM to start this year, I think part of that is a a valuation story on uh, the U.S. relative to those other markets. So you highlighted some of the reasons why sentiment was quite poor uh, in Europe and in emerging markets. And I think that's starting to now look a little more compelling as a valuation gap. So yeah. insofar as uh, a lot of people would view the U.S. as being pretty expensive, uh, EM and, and EFI comparatively cheaper. So that's part of the motivation to go in that direction. Uh, you could also maybe tell a bit more of an economic story that, uh, you know, the Fed has led a lot of other central banks in, in raising rates. Yeah. Um, so that's going to start to maybe slow, you know, the U.S. more than those other regions. So I still think those other regions will catch up. And yeah. I wouldn't necessarily think it's all clear on, the, on those fronts. Um, but one area I would maybe want to just dig into it with a little bit more yeah, detail sure. is the divergence between EFI and EM. Okay. Um, so as I described earlier, the broad allocation for us is still somewhat defensive, but we also, again, in the spirit of balance and diversification, we want to have some offense expressed yeah. as well. And one of the areas we have is uh, an overweight to emerging market equities. Okay. And normally this is a, uh, an asset class or a region that tends to sort of be a high beta version of the global economy. Yeah. But I think in this cycle, there are some maybe some idiosyncratic elements that might allow EM to diverge from the rest of the world. And you can look to the reopening narrative in China around uh, the lifting of zero COVID policy. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think a lot of people are on board with. Yeah, as, I think their, a their PMI thing. reading if, was it yesterday. I think yeah. it was like highest in 11 years. Yeah. So that so that impact of the reopening yeah. is certainly happening, happening. And that'll be beneficial for China specifically, but emerging markets. It'll spill more over, obviously, too. Uh, yep. OK. And so there's that part of the story. And also when you think of the business cycle framework that we really root a lot of our analysis in, uh, emerging markets had gone through their business cycle. So, you know, they're actually starting to maybe expand a little bit. You're seeing a little bit of policy stimulus in those regions, whereas, again, the developed world generally is focused on taking that stimulus mm -hmm. away. So I think it's still a pretty, you know, significant elastic between those regions. You can't entirely diverge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you had to think of some cyclical upside or some potential for outperformance, part of that does come, in our view, through emerging market equities. Okay. I want to dive into emerging markets a bit more finely <laughs> before we move on to something, uh, because uh, in the Canadian ETF industry, most or almost all of the emerging market ETFs are passive. All right. And I feel like if there's one area historically where it's been challenging either to implement, you know, quant type strategies like that, that we run on the factor side for, for developed markets here at Fidelity or, you know, just looking at pure passive, like it's, it's not an easy thing to accomplish with, I guess, uh, not certainty, but like precision. 
Yeah. Um, that's a big value add for active in, in emerging markets. Yep. Right? Generally speaking, the more opaque the asset class is, the more yeah. active makes sense. Okay. And that's exactly how we get our exposure. So, you know, this might lead into our conversation about how we use ETFs. Yeah, in our let's funds. do that. Let's go. Um, we'll follow up into that right sure. after this. But yeah. but yeah, generally speaking, when you think about emerging markets, where yeah, you can say you can take China for example, and you know the China story from a macro perspective can be compelling, but there are still you know, huge segments of their economy that I think you'd be pretty cautious about. So yeah. you can think about the property sector, you can think about um, parts of their economy that are subject to regulation, whether that's telecommunications or tech more generally. So to have the benefit of an active manager in that asset class or in that region is really important. So we leverage all our research platform. We've got lots of boots on the ground in, in those regions that can help find really interesting stories on a security by security basis that they can bring those into the portfolio so they avoid maybe some of the beta risk that comes with emerging markets by taking that active mm -hmm. management approach. And that's easy, even something we do with, with a futures capability on our side. So all things equal, we'd want to give our managers more capital to turn over rocks and bring ideas to Absolutely. the portfolio. But to manage the beta exposure, we'd use a short futures overlay to okay. try to maybe net out some of that impact that a volatile region like EM or, or yeah. EFI would have on the wider uh, portfolio. So that's just a little bit of a, a look into the kitchen yeah. in terms of how we put together a lot of the, the decisions that go into the portfolio. Interesting. And I guess just a reminder to, to our audience, obviously, like you're using passive ETFs. Remember, not every index is the same, right? Not every index is constructed the same. They don't have the same rules from a cap standpoint. And with emerging markets, like you're buying a big basket. And so it might feel like you're getting or you think that you're getting that diversification, but in reality, you might have some of those underlying risks because of there's no filtering. Whereas like an S&P 500, right? Well, there is an underlying filter by design because S&P 500 will include companies once they're profitable, et cetera. Yep. So it, 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 I think it just adds to the point, once again, that uh, more opaqueness, like definitely active uh, can make it. So let's, let's dive into how you guys use ETFs. Um, uh, and, and then after that, we're gonna to have to talk about the ETF that you guys manage. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, just kind of just how you incorporate it into portfolios, how you think of them. Uh, you know, maybe this, you know, if advisors are listening or investors are listening, they could even, you know, apply this to a certain extent to the way that they manage their own portfolios. Yeah, I think there are a couple of motivations uh, when we make the passive versus active or ETF versus mutual fund argument from a building block perspective. Um, first, I would say is driven by more tactical considerations. So I know ETF strategists have personalities, but ETFs don't have personalities. <laughs> thank so you, thank you. <laughs> when we contemplate uh, a shorter term move, and yeah. this is you know one of the reasons that we have to be mindful because we manage a lot of a, a lot of assets and there's uh, significant implications on liquidity. So if we're thinking about a relatively short term theme, I'm not saying we're day trading the funds, we're certainly not, but mm -hmm. for a view over a couple of months to maybe a couple of quarters. If we're moving money around, sometimes the preferred vehicle is an ETF, which doesn't mind taking money in and out uh, over that type of horizon. Whereas if we were to look at an active manager, if we go to them with a large sum of money and tell them to invest, and then a couple of months later, we want them to take that money back, or we want to take that money back, that can be destabilizing, certainly to their process, mm -hmm. and especially in regions where, again, there's maybe less liquidity. So. We tend to find in some of those scenarios, if it's a shorter term theme we want to express in the portfolios, an ETF would make a lot of sense. Um, the other motivation for us are in asset classes where maybe active isn't as, as reliable. So you can think of that maybe as US, US large cap, for example, mm -hmm. where we, we have a few portfolio managers that can consistently outperform, but generally speaking, some, of those, thing to do. Yeah, some of those markets may be better served with a, a passive exposure. Um, and other examples, we just don't maybe have the capacity or the capability yeah. in an active space. And, and part of that is maybe a function of the asset class. So I mentioned those uh, commodities, commodity for example, ETFs. like getting if you want direct exposure to gold, exactly. well, it's probably easier to just buy an ETF. Yep. Yeah. So unless so we'll, you want to store it somewhere entirely. And, and my basement's not big enough for that. So <laughs> neither's the uh, office. So. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was, if it was in your basement, it would fit in the uh, the back of the shot. Which, uh, maybe, maybe. You know, might. <laughs> give you some unwanted attention, but um, no, generally speaking, so IAU is an example of an ETF that we'll use um, to get the gold bullion exposure. That's okay. the way we want to express the view and an ETF makes a lot of sense there. And, and on the energy side, we use XLE uh, to get a broad basket of, okay. of energy companies as well. So 
you know, that'll also motivate the decision uh, to use an ETF versus an active fund. But broadly speaking, you know, the vast majority of our, our positions will be in an actively managed fund. And that leverages Fidelity's expertise in providing research that goes into security selection. Okay, really interesting. This is it's all good stuff. And I think, you know, a, a lot of times we think that it's, you know, especially for investors, I think, you know, direct investors, we have our audience is investors and, and advisors, investors, you know, that want that core exposure with their ETF, right? They buy, uh, you know, uh, US high quality, they buy a S&P 500, you're getting a basket of large cap US stocks, and it's fairly simple. But then the tactical approach is a whole, you know, a whole other way to see that. Um, and I think it's really interesting. But um, where I want to go is Let's talk monthly high income. Let's talk income focused uh, balance strategy that you guys manage. Um, it's got obviously exposure to our, our high dividend ETFs in there. Uh, so just talk to me about the process a little bit, kind of what, what your thoughts are on, I guess that, um, not allocation, but that exposure right now, obviously, you know, the income uh, focused security. So uh, I'll let you expand on, on that. Yep. So there's two funds. There's one with a larger Canadian weight and there's one with more with a larger global exposure and you know the, the the notion of those ETFs are that they use the high income high dividend as the building block but they allow all of our tactical calls to be reflected in there so instead of choosing between geographic regions by using broad market indices we're using the the high income version or high yeah. dividend version of those uh, those products so the advantage there is that you can still have that income lift uh, what, and also being able to leverage all of all of the tilts that we have and out of benchmark allocation. Yeah. So, you know, we'll we'll use the geographic uh, positioning that shows up in many of our other funds there as well. We'll take into consideration some of the macro themes like inflation, where we'll use you know, out of benchmark ETFs to protect the portfolio against that type of risk. Uh, and as well, you're getting the individual underlying beta exposure that yeah. uh, is in, in vogue as well. So you're getting the collected wisdom, I think, of the three different factors there and or three different sources. I know yeah. factors that yeah. special hey, work in ETF I like land, it. I like it. Um, but three sort sources of, of return from, you know, the, the broad asset class exposure and the factor itself, plus the tactical element, uh, plus the other benchmark allocations. Interesting. Yeah, because it is uh, it is an, it's an active ETF, yeah. right? So it's actively managed from an asset allocation perspective. And then obviously the underlying some some of the underlying building blocks, at least are factor based. You mentioned the word factor. I got to repeat it. I, I'm, I'm paid to. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's that's something that obviously we end up talking quite a bit about on, on this podcast on when we're doing our Fidelity Connects and things like that with the factor lineup that we have on the equity side. Uh, I guess I kind of skipped through it when you're t when when we were talking earlier about geog you know geographic diversification, sector diversification. Is that something that you also consider like factor diversification among your managers? And you know we have high div high dividend value, low vol uh, quality momentum. Do you kind of try like what we're trying to do is trying to mimic a successful investment style of of active management, right? Or we've tested it in that way. Um, so that's that's something you guys consider when you're building the portfolios and allocating between managers? Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, it, it flows from the earlier conversation we had about uh, trying to time the market, trying to yeah. time factor exposure, style exposures, all the rotation that goes in there. So yeah, we think the best way to help an investor through the cycle is to have allocations to managers of different styles, and that can be very diversifying. So mm -hmm. you can look in the example of the global balance managed portfolio, you know, we'll have uh, a momentum investor like Mark Schmale's Global Innovators yeah. will have a uh, dividend type factor through Don Newman and Ramona Persaud. We've got uh, value through Dan or Matt Friedman yeah. as well. So there's all yeah. of those different building blocks that uh, at various points of the cycle will outperform both from sort of a beta perspective, but also that alpha component from security selection that I mentioned earlier, you know, that uh, that is also something that we would look for, you know, kind of regardless of the wider market. Yeah, and yeah. that's something that, again, uh, has proven really valuable through our through various cycles and, and contributing to the total return we've got. Interesting. That's 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 really good. And I love that you put names of managers. I mean, obviously, a lot of people that are listening to the podcast will know uh, some of those managers. And, um, you know, obviously, when you are a portfolio manager, though, you can change over time, right? Like you can change your way of, and I think that's, you know, for example, you mentioned Mark, who's more of a momentum manager. Well, you know, sometimes he might be more growth, sometimes more value, you know, and, and can go through that, which 
is great also inside the portfolio, right? So you might manage those separate factor exposures, but then if you have some people that uh, fluctuate, that also provides some beta, right? Yeah, to, they, can, to, they can change to the upside, downside, protect. And yeah, no, I mean, that was why I was careful to describe Mark as a momentum yeah, we, type of investor versus yeah. value or growth, because that's what we want from Mark. And that's yeah. what we get from Mark is that he looks at his opportunity set and he finds the best idea regardless of, of yeah. wider factor exposures. And uh, we know that that's something that you know will work a lot of the time through the cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to have him as an important yeah. building block. He's been, he's been pretty good at, at doing that in his Absolutely. career. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, uh, he's been got pretty successful with yeah. that. Um, you know, maybe one or two last questions here before we wrap it up. And I just, you know, once again, thank you for, for taking the time to do this. Um, one, op one risk or op and opportunity uh, that you see going into this year that maybe the market isn't really respecting so far or that it hasn't maybe fully foreseen it or anticipating it? Yeah, I think that's that's a tough question to answer. And I know that's it is. why I think and you, you can, you can skate around young, it. So. You can skate around it a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't believe in skating around things. So I'm going to run right, right through cool. it. But I mean, there's the typical stuff where, yes, what happens if inflation is more persistent or what happens if central banks, um, you know, hike or, or keep policy tight longer than what the market thinks. But, you know, that's sort of the typical macro stuff that you'll always encounter. That's kind of what the the the, the main macro risk it feels like coming into this year. I think most of investors and advisors would think that's probably one of them, right? Yeah. Like if if inflation stays higher for longer, how does that impact central bank policy and yeah. whatnot? So no, I think that's I mean, that's certainly it. So I think everyone has been surprised to a certain degree with how resilient uh, economies have been in the face of higher yeah. interest rates. And everyone expected that you know, you would start to see more economic weakness. And I think it's still coming. I mean, yeah. you can't tighten policy this much without there being an impact on the economy. So that's something that, you know, we're considering and we've generally faded as a narrative. I don't believe in the immaculate decline in inflation. I don't think you'll get the no landing scenario. It's something that, you know, central banks need to engineer a slowdown. Uh, they need to cause demand to fall back to where supply is still constrained. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's there, but I think where the challenge is, um, is if the correlation structure that I mentioned off the top, if that stays broken or if that continues to fluctuate. Because when you think about a lot of people's investment strategy, it's, it's rooted from the history. So we draw yeah. out these nice relationships between mm -hmm. asset classes that uh, have helped you historically. But if we're dealing with shocks such as this inflation shock, such as a supply shock. Yeah. What do you do? Uh, exactly. <laughs> you can't rely on that same sort of rules of thumb, which you know, from our perspective as a, a tactical or an active asset allocator, it's great because there's lots of opportunity to be creative in how we provide return and how we provide defense. Uh, but I think for the market generally, trying to come to terms with that type of volatility, I think is, is going to be a challenge. Uh, so again, that's that's to me the biggest challenge that I think, you know, the market is going to try to struggle with is the nature of how correlations have okay. changed and the prospect of those correlations remaining uh, broken or, or you know, non-traditional from a, a historical perspective. Okay, that's that, that's really good. I mean, that's I mean, it is a risk, right? Like you you want ideally to have asset classes that have lower correlations to each other, but uh, okay. So that was a bit maybe a bit bit more negative. Let's go positive. Maybe sure. one, one thing that could surprise positively, or you know, an opportunity that uh, you know that could arise potentially. And once again, maybe that market's not seeing too much. Yeah, I think the. Best thing I can say that is of an optimistic flavor is that you need to remain flexible and you need to remain tactical. And that can, again, supersede any macro narrative where, you know, you do get maybe a, a you know, a benign decline in inflation without there yeah. being any economic damage. And again, I don't think that's necessarily the most likely scenario, but it's certainly a scenario that mm -hmm. could potentially occur. But I think the most optimistic thing I can say, at least from our perspective, is that we're going to continue to parse through the data. We're going to continue to figure out where the market is vulnerable to being surprised and use all of the levers and capabilities we have across actively managed funds, across ETFs, across futures, across you know a currency overlay. All of those different tools are going to give us, I think, the best set of tool, the best set of uh, of opportunities to find uh, optimism and at least you know provide that protection for investors as well as opportunities to 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 profit from a stronger market when that time arrives as well. Okay, okay. so watch out for for increasing correlations potentially, stay flexible and uh, be ready for anything this year, I guess. Well, David, this has been really cool. It's great to be in the studio for the first time. Hopefully we'll have a chance to do it again. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I look forward to the next time. Awesome, thank you. Thanks everyone.